Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending our Going Global series. Um, the November conversation is on the topic of entrepreneurship abroad. Uh, we're very lucky to host um, some fantastic founders uh, with us who have a lot of international experience. Um, Suzanne from Meatfox, who is the founder and CEO of Meatfox, or COO, sorry, Suzanne, and um, Dasha from Study Free, founder of Study Free. Um, and we also have a fantastic moderator from the Feliciano School of Business uh, faculty, Jason Frasca, who is um, very much involved in the international efforts at the business school, specifically within startup innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, so without further, further ado, I'll hand it over to Jason, who is going to um, moderate this session and um, also allow time for panelists to introduce themselves to you. Uh, one administrative note, um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's the Q&A button. Uh, feel free to put in questions throughout the conversation. Uh, if you have specific questions for a specific panelist, please feel free to add those there. Um, and we'll pause at several points throughout the, the evening to um, get answers for you for those questions. So thank you very much and welcome. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Chelsea. Really appreciate the wonderful introduction and super excited to be here. Uh, moderating this panel on international startups with one, you know, with really accomplished founders and entrepreneurs. Um, welcome Suzanne and Dasha. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I think we'll, we'll go uh, one, at, one at a time if that's okay. So Suzanne, uh, I'll start with you from meatfox.com. I guess it's best to start, what is Meatfox? What do you do and what problems are you solving? Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate the intro as well. Um, so yeah, my name is Suzanne. I'm the CEO and founder of Meatfox. Uh, we have created a software solution for independent professionals to manage and monetize their client meetings. So what that means is that we've combined uh, online scheduling, video calling and payment into one product that independent professionals can simply put on their website and allows them to accept client meetings, have video meetings, and also get paid instantly. And so most of our customers are um, either coaches, consultants, lawyers, financial advisors. So basically anybody who wants to make money with their time. And um, of course, with the, with the currently growing gig economy, but also with the pandemic, um, there have been a lot of issues that had to be solved, uh, such as uh, providing your services online, allowing your clients to get in touch with you, um, even remotely and also just saving a lot of time. Um, we know for a fact that a lot of these professionals uh, spend way too much time every month, uh, every week, almost eight hours every week on scheduling, on writing emails, and all these administrative tasks that actually can be completely automated. And that is what we are doing and what we um, decided to take on as a challenge. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an, it was an important market to, get into before the pandemic. And certainly now opportunities abound more than ever. Uh, really fascinating your point of differentiation with uh, payments and billing, right? Built into the platform. So um, with that background established, can you share, uh, you know, what, what markets are you in? Why did you choose the markets? Why, why did you um, why did you want to get into the US market? You know, what, what motivated you to go outside of Austria? Sure. Yeah. So as you just said, we are an Austrian company, originally an Austrian company. Um, I'm myself Austrian and um, I started this company in Austria and uh, realized very quickly that it was very difficult to sell our solution in the Austrian market. Um, people were constantly telling me that their clients do not want to book meetings online. Their clients do not want to meet via video. They want to meet in person. Um, their clients do not want to even like it, it was really crazy how old fashioned the entire Austrian market is and how difficult it was to convince people to actually use technology for their own benefit. And um, I actually then started doing some small tests in the US uh, because I was I was wondering if, if any other market would be more open to our technology and actually um, found some really good test results in the US. Uh, because 
the US market is just so much more open to these kind of technologies, but also much more advanced in general uh, with accepting payments online, with accepting um, bookings online. And so it, that, there was not as much education needed in this market as it was in the German speaking market. And that was kind of the first entry point, of course. Um, so we started a little more than a year ago. And I would say we were probably too early for the Austrian market. Now, of course, with the whole pandemic, the whole world has changed. And right now we are suddenly getting interest again from people that we've reached out to a year ago. Um, so it's kind of um, it's just interesting to see how now people are becoming way more open to innovations. Um, but yeah, that was actually the reason why we decided to move to the US uh, or to move our focus to the US. Um, we then sold our solution mainly through a um, third party software reseller um, in the beginning because we did not have a lot of marketing budget. We did not have a lot of um, know how in other markets other than the German speaking markets. So we partnered up with somebody who resold, uh, re who resold our solution and we actually got signups from right now we have over 52 different countries that are where our customers are based in. So we became super international in a very short time um, and without actually controlling where exactly our, um, our solution is used, which is on one hand really, really exciting because uh, we can see all these countries that we are used in and it's, it makes me as a, as a founder really proud. But at the same time, it just, uh, there are just so many challenges that you have to deal with when it comes to being completely scattered all over the place. And um, I, to be honest, I do in a way regret that we've been opening up ourselves so much because right now we have customers that are requiring certain certain features and certain things that we would probably otherwise not build. But just because we are so scattered, we have to kind of accommodate for a lot of their needs. And so um, I do think overall that it would have been probably better to just focus on the US fully. Um, but that's just how, how it ended up being. And Right now we have decided to fully focus on the US as we move forward. So all of our marketing efforts, et cetera, are um, targeted at the US, but we're still having signups from any other places as well, which are sometimes out of our own um, control area, yeah. The good problems to have, right? Fast, <laughs> expansive growth in, in many countries at one time um mo usually a founder's dream right but also could can be a challenge I, th I i'd like to i want to come back to challenges in a moment you said something kind of interesting around testing so you you recognized uh in your home market that um it was uh seemed to be a bit antiquated still right and and not ready to go online at that time uh, so how did you test how did you test internationally what tools did you use what methods did you use uh, to determine that there was opportunity in the US? Yeah, um, so on the one hand, we did some small marketing tests, but they were because we did not have a lot of budget, very limited, but they still show, showed to us a certain indication in which direction we should go in terms of market. Um, on top of that, I also created like a, a LinkedIn automation. Uh, there are lots of tools out there where you can create automated outreach to certain target groups and we knew uh, already back in the days that coach is our first vertical that we want to um, acquire. And so I did a test where I was comparing Austrian LinkedIn outreach to uh, the US LinkedIn outreach and just saw how, how they were responding to our solution and how open they were. And that already also showed us some like clear indication. But to be honest, it was a lot of um, trial and error and we did a lot of different things. We also tried to go through partners, through existing coaching schools, um, other software resellers where we were just trying to understand if there's a bigger potential in the US. And of course, because of the size of the market on top of that, there's um, a lot of um, different parts that you can tap into if you just do it right. And we were just doing a, a small different test, which I would have, like if I now did it again, I would have probably done it in a more structured approach. It was a little bit um, not, it was not very like prepared. It was just kind of getting a feeling for other markets um, and understanding if there's a bigger interest. And at the end, it was coming down to my intuition that um, based on the, the, the conversations I had with US customers, I just felt like that was the right move. And now I'm in hindsight, I'm glad that we did that, but it could have been also 
a completely wrong decision but you sometimes don't have all the information that you need to to make right decisions so yeah so we could do a whole nother uh, panel on the LinkedIn automation uh, that you uh, that you were leveraging uh, to gather data, at, you know, uh, but you, you, you discover and you determine there's opportunity in the US. Uh, what were your next steps? Did you just pick up and, and move over? Um, you know, how did you go about uh, entering the US market once you determined there was real uh, a problem that needed to be solved? Yeah, so I was um, quite lucky because I, I through uh, a friend of mine, I learned about this Alice Accelerator, which is an accelerator that's completely targeted at European companies that want to enter the US market. And so um, it's, it was funded even by the Austrian government, so I did not have to give up any shares and was able to actually join the program and um, tap into this market with the help of the network that was just provided by, by this accelerator. And that definitely gave us like the first push into the market. Um, and then I, I, I'm a very strong believer that you do need like network and people that you know are in this market. I, I think it's very difficult to enter a market without actually knowing anyone and without getting shortcuts into the market in terms of um, know-how um, on how to tackle certain challenges. And so that accelerator, but also the second accelerator, accelerator that we did, um, the Techstars uh, New York accelerator, really helped us leverage all of these, all of the information that was already available, but also leverage the network that the accelerators provide in order to just enter the market more successfully. Because what we all know is um, the US and especially also New York is really not uh, cheap and you don't have time to just experiment and test and, and fail a lot of times, but you actually have to uh, give it everything to make sure that you, you make at least small um, wins every day and improve your business and improve your company and get to the next level very quickly. And so I think that was a, a really good way of doing it uh, is through the accelerators that we did. It's, it's fascinating the, um, that there are accelerators, you know, that help uh, uh, to, uh, from one country to the next, in, um, introduce and uh, and establish themselves. Uh, in no surprise to hear, the Austrian government helped uh, in uh, in in the support of your startup to uh, to participate in that accelerator. I think that's a really fascinating um, point that we should discuss. the uh, the The support that uh, you receive in Austria as an entrepreneur, as a startup. Um, what do they do for you? What's available, and how did that help you? Uh, beyond just getting into the accelerator uh, to penetrate this new market? I think in general, the, um, I think Austria has a lot of uh, upsides and a lot of downsides. It's, it's really, it really depends on what you make out of it. Um, I think Austria is great because it's, it's a small country and they give you a lot of support um, in terms of grants that you can apply for. And so we were very lucky because we got a lot of grants um, in order to uh, build our product, but also in order to enter new markets. And so they have these internationalization grants. And I believe a lot of countries actually have them. Um, you just have to really look into them. It's a painful application process most of the time, but it is free money, basically, that is available to entrepreneurs. And it should definitely not be overlooked, I believe. Um, and even though I really hated the application processes so much that I was every time regretting that I did it. But then once I, I got them, I was really, really happy about it uh, because that actually opened us the doors that we could have otherwise not, or those opportunities that we could have otherwise not tapped into. Um, I think also, I mean, the US has like other benefits that Austria doesn't have. It's, I think, an amazing market to start a business in and it's much faster. And I think you can, in the US, actually test um, market of uh, product ideas much quicker because um, what I realized when, when entering from Austrian, from the Austrian culture to the US uh, market, I realized that people in, in the US are just so open to trying out new things. And even if they then um, um, churn and not use your, your solution any longer, they still give it at least a try. And in Austria, you kind of you have to almost convince people to to buy it, but and they almost think that if they want to, or they are they're considering if they want to use it for the rest of their lives, almost like <laughs> that's that's how 
the, what the, com the commitment is very different um, to the U.S. market, where people are just very willing to be to try different things all the time, and I think that is helping with uh, testing new new products in a different market. Um, and that is also why I believe like Austria has great great support, but uh, I think to start a company does a lot more opportunities sometimes in the, U in the U.S. I would say. Wonderful parallels to uh, to understand um, from uh, from an outsider's perspective. Thank you for sharing that. So you're established in the New York market now. Uh, you've had a chance to uh, experience uh, the U.S. What are what are some of the um, what are some surprises? What what were the some challenges that you never expected? Some roadblocks? Some hurdles? Uh, that once you had gone through the accelerator, either in the accelerator or thereafter, um, that uh, took you by surprise and maybe, um, you know, ended up being an opportunity or made you think twice about the path you chose? Jason, can you just interject, interject just quickly? Uh, we have a question, um, which I think is important to answer before uh, Suzanne answers, um, is what is an accelerator? And can you uh, give some information on that? Of course. Um, yeah, so startup accelerators are programs that basically help you accelerate the success of your company. Um, they give you, so usually it's, you apply for an accelerator, there are thousands of accelerators available um, in the world. They have, there is a ranking um, available online as well, where you can see which accelerators have good reputations and which ones uh, you maybe shouldn't do. Um, oftentimes they do take either a share of your company um, but they also, or they, they, or you actually have to pay for them sometimes, um, or most of the time. So the good ones give you also an investment, uh, which is going, is helping you set up your company or, or get your company, um, into the right direction. And what an accelerator does on top of that is, so besides the investment, you also get a huge network usually of, of mentors, of people that can help you, um, bounce different ideas, different questions that you have and get through some of the challenges that you have, especially in the beginning of a company. And in addition to that, most accelerators also have some kind of schedule um, of, of, web, of uh, seminars, of, of uh, courses that you go through where you learn basically, yeah, where you learn all the basics of launching a company, of scaling a company. Um, so that's, I think that, that sums it up. Dasha, am I missing something? <laughs> I no, I think it's pretty much it. Um, I guess like investments, that's also oh, yeah. kind of really good. And I think it's also really a lot about credibility. It's kind of like, you know, getting like a top degree, I don't know, getting like Harvard degree or like, I don't know, like getting like the first job in McKinsey. So you have like this kind of like water quality that means that's going to help you with like fundraising, with investors, with like top employees. It really opens, opens like lots of the doors and you have like really accelerated track, getting the top experience and expertise just within like three months and can bring you a company to like totally, not like just like new level, but maybe like just hundreds of levels, uh, skipping like intermediate steps. Yeah, and it's usually, as Dasha just said, three months long. Um, so it's supposed to be very short, but really have a huge impact on your company. And I think it did for both myself and also for Dasha. Um, and especially if you're doing these kind of accelerators that have a reputation such as Y Combinator, 500 Startups or Techstars, um, it does help a lot with every conversation that you might have in the future with, with investors and with people. That's just, just that. Yeah, a terrific breakdown uh, by both of you. Thank you. Um, just kind of going back, um, what were some of the challenges that surprised you? Um, yeah, so challenges, I, I guess um, one of the biggest challenge was setting everything up in a proper way. Um, I think myself and also Dasha, we made that mistake, but we had a very complex structure beforehand where we um, had a company in our own country before. Um, I had an Austrian company and then suddenly I had to uh, start uh, incorporate in the US, partly because our customers are there to a large extent, but also uh, because of investment and investment opportunities that we got. And um, most investors don't really want to invest in an Austrian GmbH. They want to actually invest in a, in a US Inc. And so we had to create a US Inc. And that was one of the biggest challenges which was really doing this flip is what they call it 
is bringing all of your um, IP and all of your resources to the US company and doing it in a way that um, you don't have suddenly crazy tax implications and other problems, uh, legal problems, etc. cetera. So um, we, I did spend a ton of time uh, figuring that out, talking to lawyers, um, paying a lot to lawyers and, and, and others. So there's a lot of costs and time involved when you're doing this. And um, if, you, if, you ever want, uh, if you ever want to start a business, this, these are things, considerations that you probably should, have, should do beforehand. Uh, I mean, for us, it was, as I said before, because of the grants and all the opportunities that we got through Austria, it was still the right decision to start in Austria and then create a US company. Uh, but if you already know where you want to be and um, if you have done your research up front, then I would recommend not going through all of these hassles because um, they are a pain. Um, and other than that, I think um, I'm just, like, I think the, the one of the surprising thing is how quickly you can actually create a company. Um, in Austria, it's a pretty painful process where you have to uh, put a lot of money um, into the company. You have to go through like a notary, you have to sign a lot of documents, create contracts. And then you, after a few weeks, you have a company. Um, and then in the, I think they're changing it now and they're making it a little easier, but still it's a pretty long process. And I was just surprised when I, when I talked to my lawyer in, in the US, uh, at some point he just wrote me, oh, this is by the way, these are by the way, your incorporation documents and it's all set. And I was like, what? <laughs> I still have, I don't have to sign anything. I don't have to do anything. Where's the, where's the company register? Where's this and that? And he was like, oh, we don't have that. And it's very easy. And also giving away shares is so much easier. In Austria, you actually have to do for everything. You have to go to a notary to, to give away shares, to change anything in your company. And in the US, there's just so much, there's, there's a lot less bureaucracy in that sense, I would say. However, there are other things where I was just surprised of like how many different forms there are still that you kind of have to understand and you have to dig into. And I think these are the things that as a founder, you oftentimes underestimate that you don't only you can't only focus on running a business and on uh, doing marketing and creating a product and hiring a team but you actually have to become pretty smart in, in on the legal side as well which uh, for me was a huge challenge to understand all of the implications to understand what i'm even signing um to to understand what i have to do um going forward with uh, taxes with uh, doing all the accounting uh, figuring out uh, right now we have to do double accounting so we have to do Austrian uh, our, for our Austrian company because we have a team there we have to do that accounting um, and tax um, all the tax implications as well as in in the US so it's just a lot of things that you have to consider and um, at some point my my lawyer, my lawyer was just saying oh my god you're going, you're creating this huge conglomerate structure for your own company why are you doing this? Is the investment really worth it? Um, and for me, it was, um, and for our company, it was, but um, I could have done it so much easier probably if I just thought about it beforehand and knew from the beginning that the US is the right market for us. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. I have one last question for you. What would be uh, the, uh, the number one piece of advice you would give to a student considering uh, moving a, uh, uh, starting an op, uh, a, a startup, an entrepreneurial endeavor in a new country? What would be the one key piece of advice? Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of things are changing currently because you don't necessarily have to be anymore where your customers are necessarily. However, I do still think that this will take time until it's actually the case. Um, I think that uh, remote working is great, but people still want to at least see on a piece of paper that you are close by at least that's uh, the case for austrian companies they want to buy from austrian um suppliers i think the same is true in the us that they want to make sure that you're kind of close by so really figuring out uh, where your customers are is i think the most important thing in researching um your customer needs figuring out if, if they're, they're customers for your business but also if they are already um, getting a similar solution from competitors and do not need you anymore. So making your competitor research in the market is the second thing that I would definitely consider. And then the third thing, are uh, all the legal implications, um, not only for your company, but also tax, uh, tax implications, as well as for your personal, um, life. 
um, because you should want to, or I would suggest creating a company in the country that you want to live in or that you want to be in because I believe otherwise it becomes just a little difficult. But at the same time, if you want to build a company in a different country, you should also check up front the visa implications that that may have because it's not always so easy to enter a different market and just um, create a company and suddenly live there. You, you have to also consider that. Um, that is also one thing that um, I completely underestimated how difficult it is to actually enter the US. I thought, oh, I will create a company and then I will apply for a startup visa and it's all easy. It's actually not so easy and uh, it does take a lot of effort. So um, keep that in mind as well. And I think lastly, I would consider uh, looking into grants and investments. So understanding how, how easy it is to get investments in those markets or how easy it is to get grants in this market. I believe that overall, it's probably more important also in the long term to look into markets that um, provide a good investment infrastructure for you and not necessarily the grant infrastructure because grants are kind of helping to survive. But I think investment is actually the one, investors are actually the ones that can actually bring you to the next level after a while. And um, what we also realized in Austria, I mean, there's, there's a huge um, support from the government, but once you're looking for investment, you actually have to also start looking into other countries where there's, uh, just, there, there's just more money, uh, more investment available. That was you know, wonderful. Thank you very much. Really appreciate all of the insight that you shared. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. Stick around. We have questions at the end. Don't go anywhere. But I do want to transition to Dasha. Dasha, thank you so much for joining us. Um, please tell us a little bit about Study Free. Yeah, hi, Jason. First, thanks so much for like inviting. It's really uh, a pleasure to share like a bit of uh, experience along the way with like students. So yeah, uh, I'm still founder of Study Free. And Study Free, it's an online platform that connects students with international opportunities worldwide. So we help students to get into colleges abroad. Uh, we help to navigate the whole admission process and ultimately to get the full funding to cover the tuition fee and loan expenses. So we create the whole ecosystem one-stop shop solution for any kind of international experience. Um, I'm originally from Russia, as you can hear from the accent. Uh, the whole team was like originally in Russia, that's where we started. Uh, we've been in the same program as Susan in the States. Uh, we're now living in the United States myself. Uh, and our business is like operational right now in seven different markets. So we actively monetize, like actually getting revenue from like Russian speaking countries, uh, Africa, India, Brazil, and the United States. So quite a lot of different markets. It was like quite a journey. <laughs> So uh, thank you, that's a uh, dynamite introduction. Why did you decide to expand into these other markets? What was the impetus? Well, first, because I guess like the, the end goal of like every entrepreneur is to, to build a global company. And I could really understand myself that there was definitely a need for a product in like all these different markets. Because I was um, studying abroad myself. So I've been living in lots of different countries. I studied in Russia, Spain, China twice worked in Singapore, in the States, and I knew there was like in all of these markets and regions, there are students who need a product and we can bring our value. So there was like a long term plan that we're going to be a global company and I'm going to be just operational in one country. Plus, when you come in from like developing market, it's like Russia is, um, basically like all the revenue you get like in Russian markets means nothing in the global scale. And if you want to be like US company, if you want to have like valuation of the business, if you want to get international investments, if you want to have be backed by like top international talents, you have to validate uh, that your global is scalable and that you're investable. And the best way is to make the proof that you can make all the money and they can get like investments and backup. That was like the plan. <laughs> that would mean like, it was like the plan during the acceleration programs to expand to to new markets to validate that our pro uh, product business model and customer acquisition channels uh, can be scalable, can work efficiently. Tell us a little bit about the validation process. How did you do that from, uh, did you go to each company to, uh, country to validate? Were you doing that from your home uh, in Russia, your home base in Russia? How did you go through that validation process to prove that you were investable? 
Yeah, I think like that's the part where I'm kind of like mostly proud of myself. I think we kind of like managed to build this international digital growth machine uh, during this period of time. So I guess like from the first steps uh, into actually generating first re revenue, it took us only two months uh, generally. So we started expansion during the COVID. So we couldn't actually travel, we couldn't be actually in a spot. So the playbook in our case was to first talk to people on a, on a site. Uh, I guess like the major mistake to make is to understand, is to believe that all you do in one country, you can just copy paste another one. And it's not just like legal infrastructure, like people think differently and the mentality is different, the culture, you cannot sell like the same thing in the same way. So what we started to do, we, we had like 100 customer discovery interviews per country uh, with like potential students. And at the same time we talked with at least like 20 local players local companies who've been operating like ad tech space, local short tech, or like some foreign companies who've been expanding to the market to kind of like understand what kind of like pitfalls we might face, what to actually have in consideration, like how like the whole mentality works and motivation. So I had like all these interviews and then like we could clearly see the patterns of like cultural background and we can understand how we could resell the same products and the same concept, just like changing maybe, maybe value proposition and changing the narrative from country to country. Because the motivation for students in Africa is completely different from like students in Brazil or like students in the United States and selling the same product looks completely different. Even like the placement, the ads, the words they're going to use in the landing page. And then we took uh, the existing funnel, the instrument was working the best in Russia because we wanted to have at least one element fixed. And then we started to run um, ad campaigns. Uh, I think like went pretty far and we kind of good with like data-driven paid marketing. So we just started to uh, to experiment a lot. Uh, in our case, we had 47 experiments per country per month. So my team almost died <laughs> during the process because like it's really fast. And yeah, we've been just like iterating and testing, verifying every single step of the funnel. Because like if someone does not buy, it doesn't mean like there was like no product market fit. It might be uh, there is like, you're not really talking the same language. Maybe uh, there is actually no need, or maybe there are some technical problems, or maybe, you know, the time is not working. So you need to validate all these potential pitfalls. And kind of create this playbook that we uh, successfully experimented across like six different markets within just like four months. And here right now, like all the revenue from like new markets uh, making up more than 30% of like global revenue. So yeah, we keep continue experimenting. We have like new problems uh, every every stage, every step of the growth. Um, but yeah, that's how that's how the process looks in our case. So many directions to take this conversation based on all of that. Um, I think we should pause for a moment, though. If you could just share, uh, just thinking back to our accelerator question. Um, you're describing the business model canvas and the lean startup approach methodology, right? To building a business, customer validation, segments and channels, by, you know, so forth. So product market fit. If you could just give us like a, a one or two minute overview of what that process is and why it's important in, uh, in building a successful business today. Yeah, I think like, okay, the, uh, the, most, the biggest mistake uh, any founder can have is to guess is not to, to ask people, but actually to guess. I, don't, I think it's going to be available. I think people can pay for this. I think it should look like this. You're just one person. You might have a gut feeling. You might think it's out there, but you need to talk to people always. So like, that's how we started. That's what we continue doing. And I think that's the most important thing to actually talk to people. Actually ask them out loud with your mouth what they actually need. And also like, actual questions should be done in a very specific way. There is really great book called Ask Mom. I think it's called like, like this way, as how to ask like indirect open questions. So like even your mom who really cares about you is gonna give you the truth about your idea. It really explains to you how you should ask like direct questions, like indirect questions from your potential customers. So it really open up uh, their values, what they actually want, because kind of like an idea and paying for the idea is completely different things. You're not gonna make a business if people kind of like you. You're gonna pay if you're actually solving a real problem and they actually ready to pay for this and they have money for this. So I guess that's crucial. And we continue doing this like in every step. Still currently we look in the business for like two years in every in every country. And just making this exercise consistently in the very first steps can really save you millions of dollars, I guess like years of experiments. And that's the most important. 
also on our side, we've been bootstrapping for two years, so we didn't have any funding until like April. So we've been like super lame, I guess, like as soon as possible, trying to, to fight for like every every percentage in conversion rates. And that creates a very just bright mentality, this survival DNA when you fight, when you only invest money, when you verify when something growing, then you're gonna spend money like in the hole in the funnel because you're just gonna lose money. But like if you wanna scale too fast, you're just gonna scale the hole. It's not like the business and not the revenue. So I think it's really important. I think like, I don't say like anything new, but it's like what is written in the books, but it actually won't make sense. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it, it's, um, you're putting into practice at a very accelerated rate and uh, very um, uh, data driven. And, and it's impressive to, uh, to hear about, you know, and, and, and witness. Um, being in seven countries at one time, trying to understand uh, the nuance of each culture um, document that, being able to create separate landing pages, right? Many websites, if you will, for each. Um, share some of the challenges with that cross-cultural competency, you know, that you're encountering. Um, are you hiring um, somebody on the ground in each company so that you're writing in the native uh, language? Um, is it, uh, you know, how are you communicating uh, beyond those uh, initial interviews to actually generate uh, momentum? Yeah, uh, I think it's a really good question. So uh, because I myself lived in so many different countries and I had to learn how to speak so many different languages, I really knew like it's impossible just to go there. Like you're going to die. Like this like maybe the dream, like naive idea of like, any, uh, like some of companies. So uh, we do have internal growth teams kind of like only focusing on like expansion but because these teams know digital marketing, data, performance marketing, analytics, and they execute the funnel. But we always do have some local people on the place. Along with the digital marketing and paid advertisement, we started to build communities and start to have like local ambassadors. So like for every campaign, for everything, we always would have local people to kind of go through the ads, go through the, um, I don't know, like uh, titles. We, we have like local freelancers, like local copywriters. Because like, for example, English in India and English in Nigeria, trust me, it's totally different English and it's not English in the United States. So we actually had a local copywriter to, to change even the titles within the emails and the text would look, look much more native. And I think it's also really important to be as open and as vulnerable as possible and to actually ask for the advice. So what we've been doing, we created a huge network and accelerating programs actually over this, uh, a huge network of local mentors who have been like really experienced in marketing and like data and the product and, and expansion. And they're really sharing their life experience on like local specifics. So I think like you don't necessarily have to hire people, but like if your idea is like, uh, there's like a lot of people who share your values gonna be willing to help you at their like early stages, uh, just to go and go through and give their feedback and yeah, just like ask for help as much as possible. That's what we've been doing. So, uh, and, and right now, like for example, in the markets that show the best results, we actually starting to build local teams just like six months afterwards. We, have, we didn't do this like at the beginning because we want to have to be fast, iterate and only if the market grows and it's validated only afterwards we start to build and invest in local teams. So you said something there that was interesting um, that I want to use as a point of connection, um, open and vulnerable. And I think that that's a common thread probably through your story a little bit. Um, you were also in a couple of uh, accelerators uh, similar to Suzanne, right? Mm -hmm. If you could share maybe um, your experience in the accelerators, uh, what did you get out of them? Why did you join? Um, what, was, what was your goal? Yeah, so we also did two. Uh, uh, yeah, as well as Susan. So one was Berkeley Skydeck, and it's uh, on the West Coast, also close to the university, which was really useful for us. And the second one is Texas, New York, uh, which is like East Coast. So like um, participating in an acceleration program is usually expensive for the, con uh, for the company, not in terms of the actual cost, but in terms of the equity, because all these top acceleration programs always take a percentage of the equity uh, of the share of the company. And doing two, it's kind of expensive and you actually need to validate that you should do both. For me, it was lots of people were saying that if I can say, but I guess like as a founder, you always need to follow your gut feeling. 
uh, there's like one great phrase uh, one mentor told us you sh you've got feeling you should drive your direction but data should drive your execution so i guess like that's how i um I call this because i realized that we do need so like our product is not that easy like we want to expand to a few different markets so we do need expo help we do need like resources we do need more time like total within six months into acceleration programs and I really could feel that we can leverage the network of mentors, of partners, and investors on both costs. And you can like integrate into this network, and then you can leverage our like let your honesty grow. And that's what I wanted to kind of like you can sacrifice a bit of the shares at the beginning, but you're gonna outpace and like gain so much more at the end. And that's gonna like work perfectly for us because Skydeck started in April and it was like for six months. And like for the first two, three months, we've been kind of warming up testing the markets, doing first steps. And then like when we started to get like first sales and we got into tech stores, so it was like mid July. And I like to compare like Skydeck was like a daycare. So like the, old, the care, they help you, you know, it's so nice. And this, and the tech stores is awesome. But it's like a SWAT training, like military training, you know, like <laughs> all that special <laughs> startup forces. So like by the time we reached uh, tech stores, um, we just were willing to, to grow, to experiment, to actually deliver. And I don't think we would be able to get this result and get like all this investment and show everything we wouldn't have like, like three to four months prior to the textures. So it all like came in place. And yeah, I was just pinning all the people with the questions all the time. I think it's also really important to question your own experience and expertise. Just uh, and especially from my culture, people tend to be kind of like closed for the feedback, like, oh my God, I know how it works. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't need this advice. You never know, you always should question market changes, country changes, you know, like, and be as open as possible, but at the same time, apply your own filter, because like it's just an advice, you have so many people with so many different opinions, but you're the only one who's responsible, what are you gonna actually use and how you're gonna apply this to your own company? Uh, I guess that's really important. A lot of wonderful directions we could go from that as well. Uh, but I want to focus on the one thing that you said, which was, uh, tech stars was like uh, military training, right? It was really intense. As most accelerators are, uh, you shared a, a post, which goes back to the vulnerable and open that I had pointed out earlier. Um, you shared a very uh, open post about your experience uh, going through the two accelerators uh, on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. Could you could you share a little bit about that? Your yeah, sure. So yeah, it was like very famous post, I guess, right now. So um, I kind of like face the situation that like lots of success from like startup and like we only know like success story. We only know like how fabulous tech French news, new rounds, you know, like all the articles. The same time, really few people really understand how difficult it is. And I remember like it was a really difficult moment for me. Uh, I think like some like in the middle of like, everyone reaches this like bottom, like emotional bottom, you know, like um, and when I reach this bottom for myself, I had like one mentor from Texters and had a conversation and he just told me like, you know what, it was equally difficult for me, even more. You just have to accept it. It's real, you know, like the process sucks. It's not about you, it's about, and it helped me so much just to realize that I'm not alone, that actually everyone is struggling. And like later on when the programs are over, it kind of like really motivated me to be to step up, to be open and vulnerable, to share like, yeah, we got this all success, we tripled the revenue, we entered like six markets, but that was actual cost because that was hard. And like, for me, I was sleeping like four hours, 26 minutes on average for like six months. I gained eight kilos on the stress. I could barely eat. I was super vulnerable, stressed, you know, like insecure feeling like about all stress and like liabilities coming in me. I was taking like 14 different pills, like vitamins per day, just to keep up my body because like, it feel like, you know, like it's kind of like falling apart, but I need to reach like the demo day and like exploration. So there is definitely cost. And uh, I'm not sure like I did this like right away. Most likely there's like some like way smarter people, best in the balance, you know, who can kind of like balance it out to make it smooth. I'm not one of them. So for me, it was really, really bad. And it's just the cost we bear. And I think like the more real we are, the more we share like the actual struggle we're going through, the more like pure support we have from each other, the easier it's going to be for every one of us. Because I mean, the life of an entrepreneur is awesome, but at the same time, it's like the best thing and this is the hardest thing of our life. So if like in like in the most, um, 
you know, like difficult times in the in, in the worst situation, we still enjoy what we do and we wouldn't trade it for the comfort zone in the company. That means like that's the very job we need to do. But we just have to admit it will never be easy. And even if if it grow, it's just getting more and more difficult. But that's the fun process. We just need to know that we're not alone. <laughs> So it was expensive in equity doing two accelerators and yeah. expensive in terms of your own uh, personal health, right? Mental yeah. and physical. So I'll, I'll finish with one last question uh, before I turn it over to Chelsea for the Q&A. Was it worth it? Definitely. I would do this once again. Maybe I would, I would try to sleep a bit more and eat sometimes, but 100%. I can, like, we just jumped over the roof. It was difficult, but it was kind of like the time when you're going to get together, when you do like IPO, you know, like, do you remember all the time we couldn't sleep, you know, like at all, you know, like we've been exiting all this market. Oh my God, do you remember how we, we started to spend triple our expense in Africa and the payment system failed? And like, that's, that's like the funnest. I mean, like, it's hard, but like the most fun coming from like all these insane stories. And uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're going to miss it. Oh, that's, uh, that's kind of the stories you're going to tell to your great children, and, you know, like, and like to future like um, entrepreneurs, like students. So definitely I will do this. Maybe just a bit different way. I, I like your positive thinking. You're already looking ahead to the IPO. Um, <laughs> I look forward to watching uh, that uh, take place. So uh, thank you for the time and, uh, and uh, really enjoyed uh, all that you shared. Uh, Chelsea, I'll turn it over to you for some Q&A. Yeah, great. We've got a few really good questions. Um, so the first is that, I, Suzanne, you mentioned possibly testing a startup in another country or market. Um, are there any countries that you would specifically recommend? Um, so, no, I, I I don't think I can recommend any specifically. I think it really depends on where you see your own expertise. Uh, if you have any kind of relation to a certain market where you know certain people, where you understand the, the users, where you understand the culture, I think that is the plus to, to even go into a market. I think it's very difficult to, to start off with a market that you have no idea about and that you have not researched and where you don't know anyone or where you don't have a relation to so i think it just really depends on on your product as well and on your own uh personal uh preference and, and your own um, know-how about a market but um yeah great thank so, you do um, you have anything else to add to that because you've ended a lot of markets in a, in a very different way in a much more structured way i would say um, I think it always comes from the demand side. We don't want just to enter the market. We just want to enter the market. There's like a fit for this. So there is like, I just want to enter. That's one motivation. If like, hey, that's going to be a problem. We can solve the product. Then yeah, then there's like different benchmark and frameworks how to identify which markets to go. But yeah, just think twice. <laughs> First thing twice before opening the company. Second thing twice before entering new markets. <laughs> Especially also because, I mean, Dasha touched on that already, that if you want to open to a different market where things are differently, where, where people maybe pay differently, where the language is different, where all of these things add adds to, to the complexity. And this is already very hard to start a business. And it's just so much harder when you're entering multiple countries at the same time and when you have to adapt it to certain um, implications in this country. So I would, yeah. I agree, oh. you should think twice. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like there's not just one consideration there, right? There's there's the fit or the demand, there's the cultural, you know, appropriateness and and you know, meshing your message into it, you know, something that resonates with a particular culture. And then there's also, um, as both of you have mentioned, the barriers to entry for different markets. And, you know, Suzanne, you mentioned that in Austria, it was a lot of paperwork, a lot of time, a lot of signatures. And in the US, it was, you know, quick. And um, so it sounds like there are a lot of, you know, a lot of variation there in terms of determining which country to go to. Uh, one of you had said, um, that you know consider that where you're going into maybe a place that you'd like to spend a lot of time in as well i think that's an important consideration just for your personal well-being as well 
Um, so the next question is, uh, which research platform did you use to target your audience? And what channels of advertising do you did you use at the beginning? Or um, if that's changed, what you're currently using now? Um, Dasha, you want to take this one first? Yeah, sure. So for like research, actually talking to end customers because you have a B2C model. Um, again, I'm an advocate for like super lean approach. We use Google spreadsheets. There's like, <laughs> you should know. There's like nothing, a lot to experiment. Um, but I would come here like the best way, especially the first stage, is not to use like any questionnaire, is actually the talk. Like actual like, like calls, video calls, but not just to have like, you know, like closed answers. Actually talking to people and like, getting like the sense and like, the emotion that helps the most. And we've been just like writing down all the questions in the Google spreadsheet. Um, there's like survey monkey, if you want to do like more like, surveys and structure like possible ways. And then like, if you want to do like market analysis, there's like also different ways. Like for example, we also do like watch, like uh, look at like similar web app, we look like uh, other like companies, like competitors in the market, like potential partners. We do like how it like, works and like insurance penetration, for example, for us expanding to Africa. Uh, in terms of like reaching out towards students, uh, because like our like target audience is students, so we mostly use Facebook and um, and Instagram. I don't really maybe recommend to use Google Ads as early as possible because first it's much more expensive than Facebook. Second, their algorithms is way worse; so it's not that sophisticated. So with Facebook, you can play a lot on data-driven marketing. You can do like like pixel optimization, and like Facebook algos just works the best. And in our experience, it can be like three times less expensive than Google. So um, um, until you actually have some budget, or you have some skills, don't go to Google because you're going to be competing with lots of brands, especially in the States. It's just like much more. Uh, and yeah, what we also do use right now, especially for B2C, especially if you're new, you need to get some extra uh, points of credibility. Uh, so like micro influencers works the best. You can go like to like, like Instagram, you can create some viral experiments, YouTube, because if you're gonna put some ad, it's gonna stay there, it's gonna grow organically. That's also a great way. And again, depends on the audience, but TikTok is growing and it's really cheap. But again, like it depends what kind of audience you need. So first, like the best the best way to, when you're gonna to talk to your students, I mean like the students, clients, ask what they use, what platforms they use. And that's the best way to understand where you should target them and where to do advertising because you wanna go what they actually were actively hanging out and consuming the information. But in our case, still Facebook, and we're just going much more actively into um, omni channels, like cross marketing, and like using Facebook as a major tool channel, and then optimizing, you know, like doing retargeting in Google and others just to increase conversion and just to kind of like capture the same audience across different channels. And Suzanne, would you, uh, are you able to share which platforms that you used in the beginning or if that's changed what you're using now? Yeah, um, yeah I would completely agree that it's the best thing is to talk to people and really have interviews and go into the into details and not just, um, like so the problem is when you're talking to people that you tend to stay on the, on the very surface. And I've done so many interviews, customer interviews where I ended up not knowing more than before just because I asked the wrong questions and I did not ask in the right way and did not really, um, I kind of checked up, checked all my, my questions, but I did not really um, get to the below the surface. And so it's really important to ask the why and to really figure out what they're doing right now. What is the actual problem? What are they, what are they, what is the biggest pain and how can you solve it? Uh, but not even so much focusing on the solution, but really focusing on the problem and figuring out is there a need for a solution like, like yours. Um, other than that, we used Facebook um, a lot for, in the beginning as well, just to experiment some things. Um, I wouldn't say we used it very effectively, but we used it in a way that gave us uh, some information on the target group. Um, and other than that, we also, there's so many Facebook groups out there that you can actually just post in. And you will always find people that are willing to talk to you, especially when you are a, uh, an entrepreneur with an idea. And don't be shy to share your idea and ask for feedback, ask for just people to help. Um, it's so powerful. And in the beginning, I was very, uh, I was, I was um, reluctant to actually share my idea um, everywhere because I was like, oh, what if somebody, can what if somebody steals my idea? Um, and 
I was I was really worried about that, and that's um, now I learned that this is completely um, useless. It's just that you have this, these worries, and that you should really focus on getting the word out and getting as much feedback uh, back from about your idea as possible. So uh, sharing it in all Facebook groups and asking for feedback and asking for help is really powerful because people are actually super willing to help, and I was surprised about that. But we have people that responded to uh, Facebook group posts that have now become our mentors and are helping us. I, one of them I talked to today for an hour because he's been helping us consistently with our approach on how to target coaches because he's a coach himself. So people are really willing to be part of your journey if you just let them. Great. Thank you both. Uh, that's, I think, some excellent insight. Um, we um, have a few more minutes left, so we won't get to all of the questions, but I'll ask the next one um, kind of as our, our last one. Both of you have participated in a couple accelerators and had good experience. Um, someone's asking, is it possible to survive and or grow without participating in an accelerator? Um, yeah, I think it's definitely possible and it always depends on the person. So there's like, you know, like, um yeah it is but uh, you should really understand uh, why you should go to the acceleration program so there's like different reasons first it's knowledge and experience like you're gonna be just like on your own you can have an access to like hundreds of like fellow founders and top industry experts and it's going to do a speed track of getting like 15 degrees in entrepreneurship and getting like knowledge as quickly as possible but not just learning on their own mistakes Second, it's connections in the network, especially if you do like B2B sales or like investments. So you can enlarge your network like much faster because you're going to do like all these introductions plus some credibility points. But I guess like first two like much more important. So like in the case when you're already successful founder, I guess you have like, you have presence, you have like all the experience, you've been down this road or like you have like lots of network. Maybe for you, it doesn't really make sense to go through this. But if you like first thing founder was like not that much experience, again, Accelerators are called, called this way because they accelerate you, your learning process, your learning curve, your success, and maybe revenue. It's not like survival kits. It's not like survival camp. So it's just a matter of time how much you can grow. I mean, like how fast you can grow, how confident you are. And um, yeah, so it's it's an exchange. They give resources and change like something. Plus they give also lots of investments. So you should really evaluate what is that you lack right now at this point of time? What do you need? Maybe there's like some alternative ways to get. It. Yeah, I can maybe add to that. That um, I mean, I completely agree with Dasha and what she just said. I think that uh, it really depends. And I know a lot of uh, startup founders that have been able to succeed in a crazy way without any accelerators. It really just depends on your own confidence and on, on your know-how and on how things work. Uh, the startup world is a very particular one, I would say. It's, it's very different, um, and you really have to learn a lot of things. I did not know, for example, before on how uh, investments work, how uh, funding rounds work, what is a Series A, when are you ready for, for, for a seed round, all these kind of um, terms that you have to know when you're also entering investor meetings. Uh, in general, being ready for an investor meeting is is not something you can just read in a book and you're ready. It's really, it takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of very bad conversations with investors until you kind of figure it out. And these accelerators really help you kind of understand what investors are looking for and how to get uh, your metrics right. What kind of metrics are they, are they interested in? But also in general, what, what you should you as a startup founder look at in your company and where should you put your focus in? And I, I do think that we are completely completely different companies since we went through uh, Texas and then before that. And um, and I think there's so much to learn that I would probably do another accelerator if I could, um, because it's just, uh, there's like a never ending learning curve. Um, but if you're confident that you have all that know-how already, then I would probably not do one. Um, I think also one thing to consider is, uh, is really making your research on the accelerators. There are many uh, out there that are not good, that won't provide you a lot of value, and that are uh, just interested in getting your shares and kind of um, getting your shares very very cheaply without actually providing you a lot of value nor the network that you need. And so um, do your research beforehand, um, read online what you can find, but also find on LinkedIn who has already participated in those accelerators and write them and ask them how the experience was, because founders are usually very honest to other founders. 
And so you will find some very surprising information if you just talk to other founders who've done that. And um, so I would, I would definitely do um, my own due diligence before entering any, any accelerators. Yeah, definitely. I will definitely agree, especially talk to like other founders, always talk, talk to people. And that's going to be the best source of information. It's the same for investors. When you are getting an investment, ask who they invested in or find, find it out yourself on the internet. It's, it's okay to do your due, due, due diligence. And it's also okay to reject an investor if other founders have made really bad experiences with them. And it's um, something that you want to see in a, in a check, but you actually have to look deeper into them. Great, thank you both so much. We have um, additional questions and I think Jason and I both agree that we could talk about this uh, for quite quite some time, um, but we wanna be respectful of everyone's time and we'll, um, we'll wrap up. Um, but I want to thank both of you, Dasha and Suzanne for your time. Um, we really appreciate you spending time with our students. Um, talking about your experiences across um, you know, many different markets in, in various countries. And Jason, thanks so much for moderating. Um, your expertise was incredibly helpful in coming up with questions and leading the conversation. Really appreciate that. Um, and also want to thank Roger for um, all of our IT support and help in getting everything set up. I um, want to quickly mention to everyone, this is a, um, our Going Global series is something that we do on a monthly basis. Um, we will have a session next month. Uh, the topic is going to be doing business in South Korea. Uh, we're gonna look at several different industries in the country and focus in on uh, COVID-19 and the response that South Korea has had as a country and how that is impacting various industries in the country. Um, so that's one to watch out for. You can uh, find out more info on how to um, sign up for these and how to register on um, our Instagram page. It's at Feliciano Global. Um, you can always contact us there. Um, you can go the old fashioned route too and email us at Feliciano Global at Montclair.edu for more info. And um, all of our sessions are recorded and uh, posted on the Feliciano School of Business a YouTube channel. So feel free to check out previous conversations there. But I will wrap up. Thank you again to our panelists and our moderator. A really interesting conversation and uh, best of luck to both of you as you continue your journeys. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Good night, everyone.